Okay. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Saturday session. Our uh, first speaker, Stephen Hopkins, who will speak on the British Compact. Oh, what's the title? Okay, thank you for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for, for having invited me here to Miami. It's my first time, even in Florida. Uh, thank you, which is long overdue. I should have Florida many, many years ago and I didn't, but now finally. Okay. So um, I will talk about rigid, compact, complex manifolds. So, um, as so the, the first thing is I, I would like to give some definition questions and results. Actually, I realize that it's not so many definitions and questions. Um, so uh, like five years ago, Fabrizio and I started to um, study rigid manifolds. We gave several definitions of rigidity. Um, so you suppose M is a compact complex manifold, the dimensions N. And then you call it rigid, or it's really locally rigid, if for each deformation there's an open neighborhood of the base um, of D0 in the base such that every fiber is isomorphic to M. So there are only trivial small deformations. And then there is the, the notion of infinitesimal rigidity which says that the first cohomology group with values in the holomorphic vector fields on M vanish. And actually in this paper, we gave a lot more um, definitions and we started, we started to study the, the relations among the different notions of rigidity. And uh, I don't want to go into this uh, for this talk. And it's an obvious remark because of Kuranishi theory, um, infinitesimal rigidity implies rigidity because H1 of theta M is the precisely tangent space of the base of the Kuranishi family of M. And of course, if you have one implication, I always tell my students, if you have one implication, you ask yourself what about the other one. Um, so uh, if you start with low dimensions, everybody knows that for a curve, um, all notions of rigidity that coincide and the only rigid curve is the projective line. And what about uh, surfaces? There we proved um, in this paper, um, if you have a smooth compact complex surface, surface which is locally rigid, then either it's a minimal surface of general type, or it's a Delpezzo surface of degree at least five, or it's a Minoue surface of type uh, SM or this other type. So this is a non-algebraic surface of Kodaira dimension minus infinity. So, I mean, in particular, either you have Kodaira dimension minus infinity or you have maximal Kodaira dimension. So in a certain sense, rigid surfaces, they are very sparse geographically according to the Kodaira dimension. Of course, surfaces of general type, there can be very many, so you don't really know. Um, if you go back uh, to infinitesimal rigidity and rigidity, two and three, they are infinitesimally rigid and for surfaces, you can ask the question, uh, is there a rigid surface of general type which is not infinitesimally rigid? Actually, we found out that this is a very old problem and it was already posed in the book by Kodaira and Morrow. Find an example of a compact complex manifold which is really rigid, but the first homology group with values in theta m does not vanish, and it's written there, not easy question mark. And in fact, it was almost 50 years later that he succeeded to give a counterexample. So uh, together with Pignatelli, we proved that there are minimal surfaces of general type which are rigid, but not infinitesimally rigid. And uh, later, more examples were given um, by uh, von Boltmann, Berling, and Pignatelli. 
So, but what about if the dimension is bigger than two? Is it still true that the uh, rigid manifolds are so sparse? And actually, you don't expect this because if you take two infinitesimally rigid compact complex surfaces, then the product is very often again rigid. It's rigid if and only if h zero of theta x times h one of o of y or the other way around if this product one of if this product is vanish. So and also if you have a etal quotient, an unramified quotient of something rigid, then also the quotient is rigid. The other direction doesn't work. And in this way, you get many examples as part portions of products of rigid manifold. And using this and a little bit other constructions already in this paper, we prove that there are rigid compact complex manifolds of dimension n and collider dimension kappa whenever n is bigger or equal to three, and the collider dimension is minus infinity zero to n. And I mean, many things were known before, like minus infinity pn is rigid. This is known um, for zero and dimension three. Um, we use this um, uh, Calabiao of Bobin. I mean, the product of three elliptic curves um, of a three thema elliptic curves, and uh, you divide out by that theta time identity. Um, but the others are all um, etal quotients of actually products of curves. Um, but you see, there is a gap. There is a dimension one missing. And the question is are there rigid manifolds? Of dimension n bigger or equal to three and for the other dimension one. And it was just that we are not looking closely enough. With my former PhD student, we proved that there exist, of course, compact C manifolds which are infinitesimally rigid and have Kodaira dimension one. And in fact, uh, these are non singular models. Of a quotient of a product of n minus one elliptic curves and a curve of a curve, which is at least two, but you have isolated fixed points, so you have a singular quotient by this root action. So here you have to pass through singular quotients. Um, yes, and uh, this is done how and when we constructed this, of course, we, we had the idea. Can we somehow get hold of this situation and give something like a classification? Okay, so I mean, what I've been all these constructions we have done so far, I mean, I've not been telling you proofs, but there are rigid group actions on uh, and with isolated fixed points essentially. So let me. Uh, Talk about this. So suppose you have a compact complex manifold and a finite group which uh, acts holomorphically on theta, and then you take the motion and you call it X. And then you say the G action is infinitesimally rigid if on the G module H1 of theta Z there are no G invariants. Okay. Um, and you observe immediately that this G invariance in most of the cases it's just H1 of theta of the quotient. So if G acts freely in co dimension one, then this uh, H1 of theta C G invariant is just H1 of theta X, where X is the quotient. And if G acts freely, then this is in fact the so it's the tan uh, tangent space of that X. Of course, if C is uh, smooth, then also and G X freely, then the quotient also smooth. So if you have etal quotients, then C mod G is rigid if and only if the G action is rigid. Okay.
So what happens if G does not act freely? So now we consider the low term exact sequence um, of the X spectral sequence. And you see you have uh, um, H1 of theta, which maps injectively to X1 of omega 1 of X. And then you have H0 with values in the script X1 of omega 1 X of X. So the term in the middle, oh, doesn't work here. So the, the, the X one in the middle is the Sadisky tangent space of the Uralishi family of X. So X is singular. And now here comes the big difference. There's a big difference between dimension two and dimension three, because in dimension three by Schlesinger's result, isolated quotient singularities are infinitesimally rigid. So the third uh, term in this exact sequence is just zero. So X1 of omega one is the same as H1 of theta X. So, and this means, so we saw that uh, H1 of theta X is the same in most of the cases is um, the same as the gene variant um, H1 of theta, theta of, of the um, of theta above. So this means X is infinitesimally rigid if and only if the G action on X is rigid. I'm talking about dimension bigger equal to three because there the last term of this sequence is zero. Now, X is singular. We look for rigid manifolds. So when is, uh, if you take a resolution of singularities, when is the X cat infinitesimally rigid? So um, here we have again an exact sequence and you see, um, so you assume that um, G acts freely in co-dimension one, and then you suppose that you have a resolution of singularities such that rho lower star of theta x hat is isomorphic to theta x. And R1 of rho lower star of theta x hat is zero. And then you see that the um, this right term, H0 of R1 is zero. So the first terms are isomorphic and the first term is just H1 of theta x. So, this means in this case, if you have such a good resolution, then um, X hat is infinitesimally rigid if and only if the G action is rigid. So we just have to take care. We have a good resolution and then we have to study the G action in dimension bigger or equal to three. In dimension two, the situation is entirely different. So the, the, if you just suppose that the quotient has rational double points, then the assumptions of the above proposition are never fulfilled. This R1 rho lower star is never zero, okay? And this is what we use to construct this uh, rigid but not infinitesimally rigid examples. So suppose for the moment, that um, you have a surface and G does not act freely. Um, and we suppose that X has rational double points and we just assume here that we have R ordinary nodes, mu one to mu R. We denote S the minimal model of X and E is the exceptional divisor. It's just the pullback of the R nodes. And then we, Call def s and def x the base of the Kuranishi family of x respectively, s respectively of x. And then we look again at this uh, tangent spaces, and we have again the um, local to global exact sequence. And you see x1 of omega 1 x, that's uh, the tangent space of def x. 
And then you have on the right H0 or X1, these are the local deformations of the singularities. You can smooth nodes, so there are deformations. And H1 of X, theta X, these are the X singular deformation. And we have the obstruction map. So if you have something, um, dimension three, this is not there because H0 of X1 is zero. But here, this is different from zero. And yet you have a class which is mapped um, not to zero, you cannot lift this local deformation to an infinitesimal global deformation. Okay? So the obstruction map, and actually the dual you can describe better. It's, uh, let's say, it's R alpha new elements in H0 omega 1 S tensor and omega 2 S dual. Um, so now, I think this was shown by Pinkham first. H1 of theta S is isomorphic to H1 of theta X plus for each node, you have a one dimensional vector space. Um, so this means that if you have nodes, S can never be infinitesimally rigid because H1 of theta S is never zero. And if you take a generator of uh, this uh, theta i, and then you take uh, the the main obstruction. So this is um, this is the Schouten bracket theta i theta i in H two theta s, and this is corresponds to this alpha mu i um, in H zero omega s omega. And then you can show if you have S and X as a buff such that H1 of theta X is zero, and this alpha nu one and alpha nu r are linearly independent, then S is rigid, but not infinitesimally rigid. And the proof is very simple. Who implies that alpha is surjective? Okay, but alpha is the dual of the obstruction map, so the obstruction map is injective. And so if this obstruction map is injective, so let me just go back to this. So you see, if the obstruction map is injective, this means that H1 theta X is isomorphic to H X1 omega 1 X. Okay. And so one, implies rigidity okay so the only thing is that these alpha nu i's you have to describe really explicitly and this has been done by cas and then we just uh, show that uh, for each k bigger than eight such that three is not divided does not divide k there's a minimal regular surface of general type such that this k is rigid but not infinitesimally rigid so actually uh, sk is a very simple construction it's just a fermat curve of degree k and uh, on the product of such two fermat curves you make c mod kc x c let me just write it so you take the product of uh, I see. Gamma curve of degree and, and then you make the proof G, G, uh, G squared, and uh, you just take the usual action, the natural action on C, and here you twist by some automorphism of the group. Okay, now, so this is dimension two, let me go back now to dimension three and bigger. So um, I told you, if you want to construct um, rigid manifolds in dimension bigger equal to three, uh, in this context, as the quotient 
of uh, a singular portion of a product of curves, in the end, it will be, then you have to find rigid G action, and then you have to take care um, that you have a good resolution. So um, if you have a product, you have a finite group acting on some manifolds, and the, then you consider the diagonal action of the product, and this is infinitesimally rigid if and only if the G action on each factor is infinitesimally rigid. And then you need that uh, the G invariance of the tensor product of H0 theta C and H1 O C J, they vanish whenever I is different from J. And the proof is just the Kunet formula. Now, we will just be concentrating on the situation where C is the product of n elliptic curves or of n minus one elliptic curves and a curve of genus at least two. And then the rigidity conditions, that they can be a lot simplified. I, I mean, uh, first you need that the action of G is rigid on the curve C and on the EIs, but this means that the quotient is the projective line and it's ramified in three points. And then you need um, you translate these other conditions in H0 of the canonical uh, divisor of C tensor H0, the can canonical divisor EI, G invariant is zero, and also for the elliptic curves. Okay. Now, uh, why are we? Studying this because these are, I mean, varieties which you can handle by algebraic data. So we can somehow search for them. We can um, use computer algebra um, programs. Yeah. So for this, recall that uh, rigid G action, we associate a triple of local monodromies in the three branch points, which I call G1, G2, G3. Um, so this is just, I mean, outside the branch points have an unramified covering, and these are just the images of the surjective map of uh, the fundamental group of P, the, the projective line minus three points, G. And then we call the triple of respective orders, we call the branching signature of this covering. And then you can ask yourself which groups can occur as groups having a really rigid action um, on an elliptic curve. And these are very, very few. So it's a semi direct product of a subgroup of Cn to the squared times um, a cyclic group of order D. And D can only be three, four, and six. And in the table, I listed um, the possible um, branching signature N1, N2, N3, and the abelianization of G and the elliptic curve. So there are only two elliptic curves of curve. I mean, the Fermat elliptic curve and the harmonic elliptic curve, right? And in particular, from this, you see that if you have a finite group with a rigid diagonal action, on a product of elliptic curves and the curve of genus at least two, then all the EI have to be isomorphic and the branching signatures of all EI are the same. So, I mean, that's obvious because just look at the abelianization, they're all different, right? So G has to act on, uh, um, on all these curves and so it's, in one exactly one of the three days. Sorry. Okay. So now um, you have a similar result. If you ask yourself when such a, I mean, such a finite portion of a wallpaper group, I mean, this. Curves which act on elliptic um, curves, they are just finite quotients of all paper groups. And when does such a quotient act on a curve of genus at least two? And there is um, 
this is very restricted. So if D is three or four, then it cannot happen that all three monogramies have fixed points. This can only happen in the case E equal to six, and then the branching signature is three, six, six. And in the, all the other cases, we have branching signatures, signature D, D, and L, where L divides the order of A. So that's very restrictive. Okay. And this also implies the following. That's why we didn't come over into either dimension one of an example of an etal quotient, because um, if you have um, a product of elliptic curves, and if our group G is not C3 squared or the Heisenberg group of 4 to 27, then or if the genus of C is bigger or equal to two, then the action is never three if the action is rigid. Okay. So only in these two cases, the C3 squared and the Heisenberg group, it can be rigid on a product of elliptic, uh, it, sorry, it can be free on a, a product of elliptic curves. Okay, so if it's not free, then you have singular points in the quotient. So which singularities can occur? And there are cyclic quotient singularities, and they are of type one over k one 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 or one over k one 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 k minus one. So this means that the matrix um, has uh, entries uh, theta, where theta is a k root of unity, all theta, or all theta and theta minus. Uh, to the minus one. Um, and in particular, these, um, um, these singularities are canonical whenever the dimension is bigger or equal to D. Okay. And we can show that if you have one of these singularities, then you have a good resolution, the one we need, such that rho lower star of theta u hat is equal to theta u and r1 of rho lower star theta u hat zero. So this is shown, um, you just give an explicit um, sequence to Corig blow ups. You talk, show this by Corig geometry explicitly and you can write down these conditions um, in terms of the fan. And, um, so this is very explicit. Okay. So now, uh, with this in mind, I told you when uh, my former student Christian Gleisman and I constructed this um, series of examples, we thought, why not look whether we can somehow handle the, the situation and classify it. Um, and let me first start with Kodaira dimension zero. Um, so uh, the first result is which I already more or less mentioned. So if you have a finite group which admits a rigid free diagonal action on a product of elliptic curves, then we have, we have at least four elliptic curves. Um, EI is the Fermat elliptic curve for each I, and the group has to be C3 squared or the Heisenberg group of order 20, uh, 27. What happens in the other case? When, uh, suppose um, your group G is different from these two groups, so the non-exceptional -except case, and there not much happens. So if you assume that G, which is different from these two groups, acts, admits a rigid diagonal action on a product of elliptic curves, then the elliptic curves are all isomorphic and the quotient is isomorphic to E to the N mod set D, where set D acts by multiplication with the fifth root of unity times the identity. So um, D is again three, uh, four, or six, and for three and six, E is the Fermi elliptic curve um, for the harmonic elliptic curve. So let me point out that this um, for D equal to D equal to N 
um, and equal to three, four, or six is already Boville constructed, then there were um, Calabiao three, four, and six poles. Okay, so in this case, if you have a, the group um, different from the Heisenberg group of C3 squared, nothing happens. We have just one essential case, so one case um, for each dimension for each D. Okay. So, uh, but if you look at this exceptional case, the Heisenberg group and C3 squared, then the situation. Uh, becomes more interesting, and uh, we just studied this for the case m equal to three and four. Essentially, four also only in the free case. So the the result is that exactly one isomorphism class of quotient manifolds e four mod g for each of the two cases. Right, one for c three squared and one for the Heisenberg group. And they have non isomorphic fundamental groups. Um, so, for the exceptional groups in dimension three, so recall there the action has fixed points. So, these are a priori singular quotients. So, let me summarize what is there. We have exactly four isomorphism, isomorphism classes of singular quotients. Um, so, for each group, okay, we have x1 to x4, which is E3 modulus C3 squared, and we have yi for i equal to, equal to 1 to 4 uh, quotients by the Heisenberg group, which are obtained by a rigid action, of course. And then we can say x4 and y4 are isomorphic to Boville's Calabiao threefold in this x3, which I mentioned in the slide four. x3 and x4 are also Calabiao, and they are uniformized by x3, three, and they admit a Crepin resolution, which is rigid. And then x2 and x3, y2 and y3 are diffeomorphic, but not bihodomorphic. And the eight threefolds form five distinct topological types. So um, I don't know if, I mean, for me, always having, I mean, how you distinguish these manifolds? This is usually very difficult for calculating fundamental groups. So let me say something here about proof and why this works here so well. So, how do we find this um, um, manifold? So let's go to the case one. So one is the case we look for um, quotients, etal quotients of E4 by these two groups. So um, first of all, I told you, you have a um, algebraic description of this. So you have the diagonal action of uh, G on E on a product of four curves, you have four local, four um, triples of monodromies, right? So VI is really, VI is really something like uh, G1, I, G2I, G3, I. Okay. And I have four of them for each curve. A local monodrome is of E goes to P1. Of course, if it's free, then you have that the stabilizers. So what are the stabilizers? These are just the powers of these elements and they're conjugate and they have to intersect trivial. Um, and then you have a big group which acts on these possible local monodromies. So which is you can um, permute them. Yeah. And then you have B3 to the four. So on each component, you can act with uh, the break group. Um, and then you have the automorphisms of G, which can act diagonally. And um, you know that uh, such four tuples in the same orbit of this big group give isomorphic quotients. Okay. So then we asked Magma 
and uh, it comes out that there's only one orbit for uh, each group. So we get C1 respectively, C2, get two manifolds. The other direction doesn't work. It's not clear whether, like it is if you have uh, um, quotients, uh, entire quotients of products of curves of genus at least two. So there it is, I mean, in two directions, there are isomorphic if and only if they're in the same orbit. But here it's not. So how can we distinguish? And here, um, Biberbach's theorem come into the game because, so let me just recall the definition. If you have a discrete co-compact subgroup of the Euclidean group of Rn, um, this is a crystallographic group. And the Biberbach group is a torsion free crystallographic group. And if you look at the fundamental groups of these etal quotients of a product of elliptic curves of a abelian variety of the porous, um, it consists of all the lifts to C4 and the linear parts. If you view them as uh, real A times eight matrices, um, they are orthogonal. So in the, the fundamental groups are Biberbach groups. Okay. Now there are the famous Biberbach theorems, which actually um, I think they were, have been overlooked for a long time. Uh, they are from 1912, and they say that the translation subgroup of a crystallographic group is a lattice of rank n and that gamma modulo lambda is finite and all other normal abelian subgroups of gamma are contained in lambda. Moreover, if you have an isomorphism of two crystallographic groups, then there is an affinity such that um, F is given by conjugation by this affinity. And then what we don't need is that in each dimension, there are just finitely many isomorphic class of um, crystallographic groups. But what we really use, what for us is important is that the one and two, they imply that if the fundamental group of our um, manifolds of our torus quotients are isomorphic, this is equivalent to say, that they are diffeomorphic, C1 and C2 are diffeomorphic, even by an affine diffeomorphism. So if you lift to Cn and it's or to R to N, then it's an affine map. And then you look, we can give C1 and C2, we can describe explicitly, and then we can show that such an affine diffeomorphism doesn't exist. So this proves part one. Part two, there we have um, no longer free action. So we can again use, associate these three tuples of local monodromies, use the braid proof times uh, symmetric proof, whatever action, and then show that we get exactly four isomorphic classes of quotients. Um, xi and yi um, for each uh, for each group, and then of course you can calculate the invariance. Okay, and if you look at the invariance, you see immediately. I mean, you see rather quickly that x four and y four are Boville's threefold, and then of course you see look at the Betty numbers. Um, for example, xi cannot be um, homeomorphic to xj if j is different from i, and to yj if j is different from i, except for ij equal to 3, right? There's a different metinax. You also see that x1, x2, and x3 cannot be um, isomorphic because they have different pg. Okay? So um, that's what I say. X I cannot be homeomorphic to X J or Y J except for I J equal to three because of the Betty numbers. X two and X three are diffeomorphic as well as Y two and Y three. 
this you show looking at the action explicitly can just be a complex conjugate in some sense. Um, and you see from the PG that they cannot be bimolomorphic. Okay. And then I claim the following you have five distinct topological types. So x1, y1, x2 is diffeomorphic to x3, y2 is diffeomorphic to y3, uh, and x4 is bipolomorphic. This is Bovin's uh, Calabria. And to prove the claim, it remains to show that xi and yi are, are not homeomorphic one, for one lesser equal to i, lesser equal to three. And there we use that the orbital fundamental group are crystal graphic. Okay. Um, so, in a joint paper with Christian Gleisner and uh, Julia Kutonski, who is a PhD student of mine, we obtain a similar classification result for Kodaira dimension one. But since we have no Bieberbach type theorems, we are there are still some quotients where we're not sure whether they are isomorphic or not. And I'll show that. Um, okay, let me talk about generalizations of these uh, results. So, um, let me go back to the theorem here. Okay, so uh, I've just mentioned two types of generalization. So one, the, the um, quotient in, um, uh, in, in uh, part one, they are ital quotients of an abelian variety. So they are special hyperelliptic manifolds and hyperelliptic manifolds um, have been classified um, up to a certain point. And you could ask to find uh, all rigid hyperelliptic three folds, four folds, whatever. Okay, this is one generalization. And the other one is um, in part two of the theorem, you have here um, X4 and Y4 are isomorphic to Bovis, Calabial three folds, which is simply connected. And it's the universal cover of X3 and Y3. Um, and one could ask, are there more calabials which are uniformed, uniformized by Bovin's calabial? Okay. Um, so I have now to go. Okay. So now, so um, this is what I said, it's rigid elliptic fourfold. So a hidden hyperelliptic manifold is a quotient X T mod G of a complex torus T by a finite group, but which X freely and without translation. You can always assume that it acts without translation because you model out the translation, you get again a torus, and then you have a, um, a translation free action. And uh, in our case, we have these two hyperelliptic manifolds, four elliptic curves mod C2 squared. Uh, in the case of the Heisenberg group, this action has the translation. Um, it's the, the center of the Heisenberg group is a translation. And um, you mod out and you get, again, a hyperelliptic manifold um, with um, this group G is also called the holon holon holonomy group. Now, how do you pronounce this holonomy group? Holonomy group. Okay. So it's both with C3 squared. So these hyperelliptic manifolds have been classified in dimension two by Maniera de Francis and Enrico Severi. In that, so it's kind of classical in dimension three. It has been done. Um, I don't know if it's Shida and Yoshihara and then Lange and then Fabrizio and his PhD students, his former PhD student, same like that they showed that the missing case before actually exists, which was before excluded. So this is completely classified. 
And then um, in his PhD student, uh, in his PhD thesis, Andrea Dim Life, I think, just undertook this enormous business of classifying um, hyperelliptic manifolds in dimension four. Actually, he classified the possible holonomy groups, which are, I forgot, maybe 73 or something like this, a huge number. <laughs> Um, actually, he did it practically without the use of uh, computer algebra, so it's um, it's amazing. Okay, but so then they started, they like and Gleisner, they started to work on what are rigid hyperelliptic manifolds, and they showed that uh, in dimension two and three there are no rigid hyperelliptic manifolds, and um, if dimension equals four, then the holonomy groups can only be C3 squared for um, the height of group again of order 27. And uh, what they showed is there are exactly 12 bipolomorphism classes of rigid hyperelliptic four folds with holonomy group C3 squared, and they form eight diffeomorphisms. So ours, the, the two which I exhibited in my theorem are in this, are two of this 12. Then there are four biholomorphism classes of rigid hyperelliptic four folds with holonomy group, the Heisenberg group, when they have pairwise distinct fundamental. So they not only classify the holonomy group, but also all actions. And essentially the, the, the um, tools are more or less uh, an, yeah, an adoption of the, 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 the tools we did uh, with the product of elliptic curves and um, and then of course the um, theorem essential. Okay, so and then um, there is uh, uh, Gleitner and uh, Kotonsky, they um, they studied the case when all the, um, I mean, they wanted to see which, uh, essentially, which Hadamiyao they can get as Ital um, Gauchos or Bovils Hadamiyao. And so their theorem is if you have a finite group admitting a holomorphic and translation free action on a three dimensional abelian variety with isolated fixed points and such that the volume form is preserved, they don't even have to. Um, um, ask that it's um, uh, that it's rigid. This comes out a uh, posteriori. Then either G is cyclic of order three or seven, or it's C three squared or the Heisenberg group. Then there are exactly eight biholomorphism classes of quotients: one for C three for the cyclic group, one for one for each uh, cyclic group. Four for C3 squared and two for the Heisenberg group, and they're all pairwise topologically distinct. They are all Gorenstein threefolds with trivial canonical class admitting a rigid smooth Calabiao as preference solution. And the first two are simply connected for so A mod Z3 and A mod Z7. And the other six are uniformized by C1. So they are etal quotient of C1. C1 is rigid, so also the quotients are, of course, rigid. So this is something which partially has been already done. So the possible groups and the fine classification, fine classification in the sense that all the group actions were um, classified. This has already been done uh, before by Ruan, Yao, and Luiso, but uh, this uh, fine classification is non, not simply connected case is new. And uh, Julia, she's working now, she's studying now this quotient. If you drop the assumption that it's um, isolated singularities, it looks whether she can construct other calabiaos in this way. Okay. So I'd like to stop here. Thank you.